Hey everyone, we're back with another hardware news recap for the week, and this one is it's a bit of a spicy one. We've got some thoughts on Intel's hot take on benchmarks and the tremendous hypocrisy of the company. Uh, we'll also be talking about stock and availability of CPUs that have been announced or have come out with benchmarks lately. Oh yeah, those aren't allowed, by the way. We'll talk about that in a moment. AMD's shipments of 553 million GPUs since 2013, Corsair with uh, a bit of a, a recall situation for one of its SFX power supplies, a class action lawsuit about incognito mode, and some more. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly's Conductonaut Liquid Metal. Conductonaut is what we've used in all of our liquid metal and D-Lit thermal tests, capable of dropping CPU thermals significantly when replacing the stock thermal interface. Lower CPU thermals don't just allow better overclocks, but also lower noise levels because the transfer efficiency is increased. The mix of gallium and indium makes for a thermal conductivity of 73 watts per meter Kelvin, outclassing traditional pastes significantly. Learn more at the link in the description below. First up, a quick GN announcement. We've restocked these shirts. This is the GPU Disappointment Front Only shirt. So if you wanted to buy one of these and it was out of stock the last few weeks, they're back on the store now on store.gamersnexus.net. We've also restocked the blue, uh, the blueprint shirt that's literally blue with a blueprint style GN logo on it. So you can check those on the store if you've been wanting them. Intel's new hot take on benchmarks. In a YouTube video addressing the upcoming virtual Computex 2020, Intel CEO Bob Swan presented his hot take on benchmarks and how the PC community should move away from them and instead focus on benefits of the technology at large. Quote, we should see this as an opportunity to shift our focus as an industry from benchmarks to the benefits and impacts of the technology we create. The pandemic has underscored the need for technology to be purpose-built so it can meet these evolving business and consumer needs. This is a moment for our industry to come together. Creating technology that enriches lives, that creates value, that supports and accelerates positive business and societal benefits should be our collective goal, said Swan. Swan also said, and now more than ever, we'll all have an increasing sense of responsibility, not just for the products we make, but the role we play for the world and our ability to make a difference. In the same breath of all of this tremendous hypocrisy, Bob Swan also said that, quote, later this summer, we'll introduce Tiger Lake and cement our position as the undisputed leader in mobile and PC computing innovation. So fewer benchmarks then is what Intel wants in favor of trusting the multi-billion, that's actually a, an undershoot, but multi-billion dollar company and taking them at their word when it comes to undisputed leadership. We don't need benchmarks for that. And as a uh, as friend of the channel, Der Bauer would say, okayface.jpg. GN at this point would like to take another spin of the wheel of fortune and solve the puzzle. I'd like to, I'd like to solve for ironic juxtapositions, please. Can I get ironic juxtapositions on the board? One of the points of benchmarking and testing, like we do, is to determine how valid a company's claim on leadership is. Intel, by the way, is the same company that pushed, quote, real-world benchmarks the instant it started having trouble. So we should reduce our focus on benchmarks and also focus on them. Maybe, the, maybe that department of Intel didn't get the memo. But either way, we should both focus and not focus on benchmarks. It goes without saying at this point, but these comments obviously paint Intel in an unfavorable light. Just look at the like to dislike ratio on Computex's upload. I feel kind of bad for Tytra for uploading that one and taking the hit for Intel. But either way, it's not something that's reflected very positively on them. And this is very clearly an attempt to shrug off, of, shrug off some of the blows that AMD has struck upon Intel with its recent launches. Intel wants to be Apple, it seems, because Intel wants you to base your judgment of a product on how magical it is and how it makes you personally feel, as if emotions affect the performance of the product. And of course, if the product doesn't perform well enough to evoke positive emotions, they need to figure out other ways to make those happen, like indoctrinating the user base. So we'll see if Intel goes the Apple route and starts marketing on magic and wizardry and how good it makes you feel. Now, in regards to the mobile market and Tiger Lake, it is true that it's Intel's market to lose. AMD has been working hard at trying to get into the mobile market further. For instance, for the first time, HP is now selling both Intel and AMD equipped notebooks in its own line of gaming laptops. As for Tiger Lake, time and testing and not trusting in 
benefits will tell the story of how good the products actually are. And as for the rest, well, we'll see if Intel is able to lay claim to any of the crowns that it finds appropriate for feeling the benefit of the product or whatever it is they're saying now. But it's all about responsibility, right? That's, that's what this situation has taught us. It's all about making the world a better place, as they say in the show Silicon Valley. Let's move on to another topic, stock and availability of new CPUs. AMD and Intel have both pushed new CPUs lately. AMD, of course, with the Ryzen 3 3100 and 3300X, and Intel following up quickly with an actually kind of good, in some ways, product line of Intel CPUs from the i5, i7, and i9 categories. The i5 in particular, the 10600K, has been the most interesting of the KSQs for the enthusiast audience, but is difficult to find on the market. And these Ryzen CPUs also remain difficult to find, and we have a bit of an update on the availability. So one of our video editors, Keegan, who's probably editing this video as well, had recently pre-ordered the Ryzen 3 3300X. And, be and before you ask, why would someone who works at Gamers Nexus pre-order a product, don't you say not to do that? Well. One of the benefits of working here is that you know a little bit in advance of its release if you should pre-order based on our benchmarks. Our benchmarks, of course, which are illegal, at least according to Intel's new philosophy on them. So the 3300X, Keegan has unfortunately found out, has uh, had its launch date shifted a few times. And he was supposed to launch it on May 21st. And Intel was supposed to launch its CPUs one day prior on May 20th. The Ryzen 3 3300X and 3100 were both pushed back to later in May. They were pushed back again to June 16th availability for retailers and then pulled forward a little bit. So it's moved around a lot in the last week or two. We spoke with some major retailers and found that the launch dates are completely pursuant to AMD's ability to get the products available. So at this point, it's not a matter of getting around to listing it. It's a matter of getting the CPUs in from AMD. So the AMD new CPUs are supposed to be up sometime within the next week or two, the 3300X and 3100. You may see a couple already out there. Be careful because the ones we've seen have been massively overpriced and that's common for scalpers and people trying to take advantage of those who don't really quite understand what it is they're trying to buy. As for Intel's new CPUs, some of the non-K SKUs can be found right now, but the i5, the i9, and the i7K SKUs are harder to find, especially the i5 10600K. Inventory is scarce at this point, potentially because Intel is busy with societal impact. AMD has shipped 553 million GPUs since 2013. In a new report by JPR, it seems AMD has shipped over half a billion GPUs in its Radeon IP portfolio since 2013, both including DGPUs and APUs. Starting in 2013 with AMD landing semi-custom silicon deals with Microsoft and Sony for the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4, respectively, AMD's annual GPU shipments topped 87 million for that year and have only gone up since. Moving on to 2014, that number has more than doubled to 177 million shipments. In 2015, AMD saw another impressive jump to 246 million shipments. And by 2016, shipments were at 322 million. From 2016 onward, it was more of the same upward trend. 398 million by 2017, 474 million by 2018, and 553 million by 2019. Interestingly, Sony's previous PlayStation 4 accounts for 20% of AMD's cumulative Radeon shipments, according to JPR, while Microsoft's Xbox One comes in at 9%. Additionally, notebook APUs and discrete desktop GPUs make up a significant portion of AMD's shipments, but we don't have data looking in at the individual sales volume of things like desktop GPUs. As usual, for strict IGP shipments, Intel takes the lead there since most of its CPUs include an integrated graphics processor of some kind. NVIDIA, for its part, takes the lead for most discrete GPU shipments, so everything else, as you would expect. However, AMD beats both Intel and NVIDIA in terms of raw GPU silicon shipped in terms of demand for all markets. Collectively, JPR credits this to AMD's channel and platform diversity and also notes that AMD is working on getting its RDNA 2 IP into Samsung phones, which will further shape the GPU landscape. Next up, over at the Corsair forums, the company recently posted a notice about a bit of a recall for some of its power supplies, particularly in the SF series of PSUs. On top of selling these units to consumers separately, Intel also sold these power supplies in its Corsair 1 product line. So if you've purchased one of the pre-built systems from Corsair, it might be affected. And you can check the 
serial number, the part number on the power supply to determine whether yours is within the batch of affected PSUs, whether you need to worry or not. In its notice, Corsair states that the increase in RMA rates for SF series SFX power supplies has recently been more noticeable and it prompted an investigation into the returned units from customers. Corsair ended up finding out that uh, the SF series power supplies are subject to fail if exposed to both high temperature and high humidity. The issue can apparently manifest either directly out of the box as the unit is powered on for the first time or at some point down the road as the power supply is exposed to certain environmental conditions. The fault seems to be on the primary AC side of the power supply and isolated from the secondary side where the PSU delivers power to the components. The issue could possibly affect any power supply with the lock code range of 194448 and then blank blank to 201148 blank blank. So fill in those two blanks with yours. If the rest of the numbers at the front of that product identifier, the lock code, uh, are on your power supply, then you should probably just RMA it and go through the recall. Corsair stated that these were the affected products were released between October 2019 and March 2020, and it states that any power supply made before October 2019 is unaffected. Corsair also says it will try to replace affected customers' power supplies in advance, where possible, as having to RMA a power supply is a disruptive process, and Corsair recognizes that you're without a computer if you don't have one. Lock codes can be found either on the power supply's packaging, if you have it, or on the power supply itself. If you find yourself in possession of one such affected Corsair power supply, we'll have some links in our show notes document linked below in the description, where you can follow along to get yours replaced. In our recent trend of covering the more litigious news items in the tech industry, Google finds itself at the center of a new class action complaint evolving to lawsuit for its incognito mode. Google and the incognito mode lawsuit this time are attracting the attention of the District Court of Northern California where the complaint was officially filed. The lawsuit alleges that Google has been tracking users and scraping data through incognito mode unbeknownst to the users. And the crux of the lawsuit seems to be on how Google marketed its product and marketed incognito mode, particularly how users perceive what incognito mode does and the scope of its ability to make you incognito. Support documents for Chrome make it clear that incognito mode isn't exactly private, and these are publicly available. However, the lawsuit alleges that nowhere is Google upfront about its data collection practices, and that Google is giving users a false sense of control over their data while browsing in incognito mode. Quote, well aware of consumers' legitimate and reasonable concerns over privacy, Google assured, and continues to assure, its consumers and users that they, and not Google, are in control of what information they share with Google. Google further represents that subquote across our services, you can adjust our privacy settings to control what we collect and how your information is used. And the lawsuit reads, nothing could be further from the truth. The lawsuit outlines that Google uses its many tentacles to scrape user data, including Google Analytics, Google Ad Manager, Google Applications, and Google Sign-In and the button thereof for certain websites. Quote, when an internet user visits a web page or opens an app that uses such services, over 70% of all online publishers use such a service, Google receives detailed personal information such as the user's IP address, which may provide geographic information, what the user is viewing, what the user last viewed, and details about the user's hardware. Google takes the data regardless of whether the user actually clicks on a Google-supported advertisement or even knows of its existence. The quote continues, this means that billions of times a day, Google causes computers around the world to report the real-time internet communications of hundreds of millions of people to Google. Interestingly, the lawsuit seems to lean on the U.S. Federal Wiretapping Act as a means to uphold its claims. The lawsuit states that Google has infringed upon users' privacy, really nothing new here, and that it has intentionally deceived the users. The class action lawsuit is currently seeking $5,000 in damages per user who has used Google Chrome, and that's dating back to June 1st of 2016. Unfortunately, Google probably knows whether or not 
EVs incognito mode, although then it's a bit of a fun play at if they reveal that. Windows 10 update and adding GPU scheduling, hardware scheduling available to Windows 10 now. Microsoft has begun rolling out its May 2020 update for Windows 10. This update's already been available to early access users who wanted to preview the updates in advance, and now it's coming out for public with the Windows Display Driver Model, or WDDM, version 2.7. With WDDM 2.7, Microsoft will deliver on its promise of hardware-accelerated GPU scheduling, a feature it has been previewing, again, for insiders. WindowsLatest.com reports that in addition to installing the May 2020 update, users will also need new drivers from their respective GPU vendor, AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA. AMD has said a future driver will add proper support, while NVIDIA technically supports WDDM with its game-ready drivers just not the latest version. NVIDIA notes that its driver version 450.99 will allow users to toggle the, quote, hardware accelerated GPU scheduling setting, but it may not work. NVIDIA also notes that a future game ready driver package will enable full support. This is a really interesting update too, because in theory, it should allow the GPU to manage its own VRAM without direct overhead from the OS. So we're removing, removing potentially an abstraction layer from the process. Hardware accelerated GPU scheduling should theoretically make room for increased performance and reduced latency if it works as expected. The feature is supposed to be API agnostic as well, meaning it'll work fine, in theory, with DirectX, Vulkan, and OpenGL alike. We'll keep an eye on it and see what happens once support has been launched at a driver level for the video card companies. Intel saying goodbye to Coffee Lake S CPUs. It seems that Coffee Lake's time in the sun is over. And Intel, with its release of new PCNs, is signaling the end of life for the Coffee Lake lineup, in addition to some other product lines. Coffee Lake, or 8th gen Intel CPUs, or Skylake, going to go with three, maybe four, depends on how you count them, was more of an iterative 14 nanometer plus plus silicon for its uh, CPU offerings. That launch succeeded KB Lake S. However, Coffee Lake was actually pretty exciting. If for nothing else, then its representation of Intel's first hexacore processors in the mainstream desktop core series. Coffee Lake S CPUs began entering the market in late 2017, actually delivering a huge blow to AMD's first gen Ryzen parts and regaining some of the market. That included some models dropping later in 2018 along with most of the motherboards, and it properly marked Intel's response to AMD's Zen-based CPUs and renewed the core wars. And don't confuse, by the way, Coffee Lake S with Coffee Lake Refresh, the latter of which is the 9th gen and home to the 9000 series CPUs. Those aren't going anywhere, at least not yet. The EOL notices affect nearly every 8th gen CPU, including Celerons, Pentiums, and Core Series CPUs. Xeons seem to be the only exception at the moment, and Intel is also sunsetting certain compute sticks and NUCs that use 8th gen chips. The EOL was effective beginning June 1st. Intel is further taking orders until December 18th, 2020 that is, and last orders will ship on June 4th of 2021. And finally, for our last bit of news, it's a story about the government and internet protocol. The DoD, since 2003, has been trying to migrate to IPv6, and so far has had two botched attempts at doing so. The third failed attempt instills further lack of confidence that it'll end any differently anytime soon. This was summarized by the U.S. Government Accountability Office and noted that the DoD's most recent attempt at a migration to IPv6 began in April of 2017. The DoD's past attempts at moving to v6 were cut short, largely because of security concerns, as well as a lack of personnel trained in IPv6. However, in an audit of the DoD's current IPv6 plant, the GAO has found that the DoD has failed to address three out of four critical steps in developing an IPv6 strategy, which means this attempt isn't likely to go any better than the rest of them, assuming nothing changes. The Office of Management and Budget, or the OMB, has previously required all federal agencies to submit plans for transitioning into IPv6 eventually. And as such, it has outlined a, a few basic requirements in establishing those plans. The OMB has set forth the following planning requirements. One, assign an official lead to coordinate agency planning. Two, complete an inventory of existing IP compliant devices and technologies in the agencies. Three, develop a cost estimate. And four, develop a risk analysis. Out of these four, the DOD has only managed to complete one, assign an official lead to coordinate the IPv6 transition planning. Furthermore, in February of 2019, the DoD released its own plan for migrating to IPv6 
that consisted of 35 transition steps, 18 of which were to be completed by March 2020. And thus far, to date, the DOD has completed six out of those 18 steps that were supposed to be done by a few months ago. The GAO notes that without an inventory of the IP-compliant devices, an estimated cost, and an estimated risk analysis, it is unable to proceed. The DOD, it says, is significantly reducing the probability of a successful migration schedule. And unsurprisingly, after its audit, the GAO is now recommending that the DOD pretty much do what it was already supposed to have done per the OMB's requirements previously. That is, develop an inventory of IP compliant devices, IPv4 and v6, and develop an estimated cost to migrate the infrastructure to IPv6, and then finally to detail the possible risks. However, it seems that the DOD doesn't agree with the recommendation to complete the inventory of IP compliant devices, but it has seemingly agreed to the other two options. While the internet at large is still transitioning to IPv6, which is taking a long time, obviously, the DOD's transition seems to be going agonizingly slow. In the meantime, however, IPv4 and v6 operate in parallel, though they won't forever. And at this rate, the DOD may run out of time. We'll see how they do, because it doesn't have another 17 years to keep working on this problem. That's it for the news this week. Thanks again for watching, as always. To support us directly, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net and grab one of these shirts, the one that I'm wearing, but, but not literally this one. That would be weird, kind of probably gross after filming this, too. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you'd like to help us there. We just released a new behind-the-scenes video where we talked about some cool technology we picked up locally. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.